we're back for our afternoon session. We are going to do a pediatric lecture this afternoon that will um, primarily be an assessment. And this will prepare you for our simulations that we're going to do this afternoon. Same thing. <coughs> Once we move from this room, if you want, go ahead and bring all your stuff upstairs to Osler. That way, once we do those simulations, you can depart from there. It's up to you. If you want to come back down and get your stuff in, we're good with that, too. So, to do our lecture is Gail from the nurse educator from the PGD. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name's Gail Schoolden. Um, I'm the clinical nurse specialist in the PGD, and I've been there been at Hopkins pretty much since 81, so I'm dating myself, I know. Um, I have worked adults, I have worked peds, I've worked ICU only for adults, mostly trauma. Did the PICU here for about eight years, and then eventually ended up in the PTD, where I've gone on to make that sort of my niche in uh, pediatrics. And fortunately can say I still really love what I do. So I'm, thank you for having me here. and letting me share a little bit about what I know, and hopefully that will increase your comfort um, in taking care of kids when you have to transport them. So you walk into a room for a child. What's the first thing you notice? <laughs> They're small, yeah. But you kind of look across the room, and you can get a feel, even if you don't know a lot about kids, who looks sick and who doesn't. Am I right? And there's a specific thing that you do that I did it all the time, but heard about this pediatric assessment triangle years after I'd already been doing it. But that's just a good way, good starting point. You walk into that room and say, sick or not sick. So it's quick. You don't touch the patient at all. Um, and it just gives you an indicator of how to start looking at that child. You're looking at their parents. Are they interacting with the parent? Are they screaming, crying, and consolables, arching off the bed? Or are they limp and not responding at all? Usually you don't want a kid to cry. You want to keep them calm. We like it when kids cry when you put an IV in because they're supposed to. So looking at their appearance and their interaction, what's their work of breathing? You can look at a kid and say, hmm, that's working hard. You know, We'll talk a little bit more about what that includes later. And what's their color? Our preferred color is pink, um, but they can be pale, mottled, cyanotic, gray, dusky, and any shade in between. So those are the three points of that pediatric assessment. I go quick, five seconds across the room, hmm, sick, not sick. Then you're going to go into your primary assessment. What do you see here? Right. This kid's working hard to breathe, retracting like that, right? Okay. So pediatric assessment triangle is your starting point. Then you're going to do your primary assessment. That's the same no matter what course you take. Airway, breathing, circulation, and disability, right? E is your environment and exposure. You've got to unbundle the kid to know what's there, especially if you're transporting a patient. What are you starting with? Um, but you also have to think about the environment and keep them warm. And then vital signs. What's normal for a kid? It's different by age, isn't it? And a lot of things have impact your vital signs as well, which we'll talk more about later, but know what the patient baseline is. And then we'll go through a little bit more about a head-to-toe assessment. We already talked about what's included in your primary assessment, and we'll talk about each one of these next. So airway. Kids have a different airway than adults. It's smaller. Um, it's more anterior. They have a huge tongue. What does the tongue do in kids that it doesn't do as much in adults? It obstructs the airway because it's bigger and their mouth is smaller. Um, they have a shorter trachea with a funnel shape at the cricoid cartilage, which forms a natural cuff. It used to be we didn't intubate kids with cuff tubes. We now do because they've changed the cuffs. They're really small. They're thin. They're, what are they called, micro something. The name's escaping me right now. But they're really nice, and you can put the tube in and not blow that cuff up, and then blow it up if you need to. Um, but just be aware, they do have a really narrow part of their cricoid cartilage, and things get stuck there if they aspirate sometimes. Um, they also have a big occiput in babies, like under the age of about 18 months. What does that do? You lay them flat, it flexes their neck, it occludes their airway. Okay? 
So the other th the thing to take away is their airway is easily obstructed. This is an adult airway right here. I have a sonometer of swelling. I go down like this. I still have a lot of room to breathe. If I start with an airway this big and have a sonometer of swelling, I have a really tiny straw to breathe through. And that's where the difference comes that's so impactful for kids as well. And then positioning is your friend. So if you're assessing an airway, first you want to know their level of consciousness. Because can they protect their airway? Is it open and patent simply by their level of consciousness? Um, drooling. I have an eight-month-old drooling. Am I concerned? Probably not case they might be breathing and babies drool. But if I have an eight-year-old drooling, am I concerned? Absolutely. They can't handle their secretions. That's what makes kids difficult because it's very age dependent when you look at kids for some of these things. Airway, you shouldn't hear anything but just breathing. And hopefully it's just the in and out of air movement. So any sounds are abnormal. I know a lot of people snore at night, but that is an airway obstruction. And we do, don't really want to hear an awake kid snoring at all. That means something's going on. They could be gurgling, secretions of blood in their airway. They could have strider. That's not normal either. Do they have any facial swelling or an injury? Depending on what type of patient you get, maybe the problem is there's something swollen on their face, and that's why you're bringing them here. That could occlude their airway. Is there a foreign body? Positioning, the next slide, we're going to go over that. Like I said, that's your friend. And is there any airway injury? Not only from trauma, but burn. You've got a kid that spilled hot water. They're coming from another hospital to us, because we're the burn center for kids, right? And they've got it all down their chest and over their shoulder. Well, it was really boiling hot water. And when it hit, they went, <gasps> what about all that hot steam? They could have an airway burn. So be cognizant of that as well. So this is the slide about positioning. The child on the left is in a great position. Notice the roll under the shoulders, and they're very neutral. Their ears are even with their um, uh, shoulders. And that's how you want them. You want a shoulder roll and what we call the sniffing position. Um, consider your C-spine, and if it's a trauma in a patient, can you do head tilt chin lift, or do you need to do jaw thrust? But you can see the picture on the left. That was the position I was talking about with their head flexed and with that nice jaw thrust. They're in a nice neutral position and their airway is now open. Adjunct devices, an MP and an OP oral airway. When do we use an oral airway? What do we need to remember about that? Yeah, and no gag, right? We don't want to make them gag and puke. That makes a really big mess. Um, and they don't do well when they aspirate. Um, MP airways, when can we use those and when do we not? Can you think of a time we shouldn't use them? Yeah. So we just basically say anybody with a head injury or any sort of facial and head trauma, we don't use anything nasal until we find out because you don't know initially if there's a basal or skull fracture. So we just don't use them in those kids. A great kid to use it in if you go transport this child somewhere within the hospital or from another facility to us, a seizure kid who's postictal. It helps keep their airway open and you can suction secretions out. And so it's really a good lifeline. Because you don't want to intubate those kids if you don't have to. If you have to, you do. And sometimes they don't like to breathe after all that medicine and you will, but that helps. Um, suctioning is a big thing with kids. Remember, especially in infants, they're obligate nose breathers. If their noses are stuffy, they can't breathe. So you have to suction good. Um, and then, of course, definitive airway if they're really not patent and not maintaining it on their own. OK, let's talk about breathing. What do you know about a, a one-month-old's respiratory rate compared to a 20-year-old? A lot faster, right? Absolutely, because they, kids have a higher metabolic rate, so they need a higher respiratory rate to support that and to get out good oxygen delivery to the tissues. But they also can, with that increased uh, respiratory rate, they have increased insensible losses. So they lose fluid very quickly through their respiratory pathway. Um, and you can also deplete your glucose stores because you're working harder to breathe, more muscle use. Um, you don't have great oxygen stores. They're a little bit uh, 
less in kids than what an adult can have, and they're more rapidly depleted, which means they're easier get into hypoxic states more easy. A couple of other things with kids, their ribs are more horizontal. Ever think about the two and three year old, they have those big old bellies? Well, their ribs don't come down and cover their spleen and liver very much like they do in adults. And as they get older, that happens. By about the age of eight, they have a more normal, uh, more adult anatomy. Um, but what that means is they can increase their tidal volume very much because they're a little more restricted in their movement. At the same token, those ribs are really cartilaginous. Cartilaginous. They're full of cartilage. <laughs> and um, they're very pliable, which means they can sustain a big hit to their chest and never have a rib fracture. It doesn't mean there's not underlying injury. If you see bruises on the chest, chances are there's probably a bruise on the underlying rib. There could be a situation though where you have absolutely no fractures. Um, thin chest walls. What does that mean? How can that impact a child? Anybody know? Well, I have a pneumothorax on this side, but I still hear breast sounds. Why? It's referred. You have thin chest walls, so you can hear breast sounds when there is none, so don't let that fool you. Um, they have fewer alveoli, so there's less surface for gas exchange, so again, they can get into uh, more distress and be hypoxic a little more easily. Breathing patterns. If a baby, a normal four-week-old baby, you're holding them, they go, <laughs> do you worry? No. That's a normal pattern of breathing for a neonate. They have what we call periodic breathing. When we're concerned is those little apneic periods go longer than 20 seconds, then there's something clinically wrong. Of course, you always, that's not a blanket statement for every patient. You look at the whole scenario. But in general, don't be too worried about it. Gastric distension, this is a big issue for kids. Their bellies blow up, they have small chests that you can't ventilate. Make sure you consider if you're having trouble ventilating a child or if they're having trouble taking a deep breath, do you need to decompress their belly? Um, abdominal pain. A kid comes in with a, a significant belly injury or bad appendicitis or a firm hard belly and they can't take a deep breath because of their belly pain. That will happen. The most significant thing I've seen repeatedly, having worked so many years in the ED, is kids that go flying off their bike and get the handlebars to the belly, and they come in and they're like, I can't take a deep breath. I don't need a CT scan to tell me the kid either has a liver lack or a splenic lack. It depends on which side the pain's on. And so they always do. So just it can be pretty significant how self-limiting um, the belly pain can be to breathing. So assessment, first thing, are they breathing? my first question, and then how fast? Again, you need to have an idea of what the rate should be for the age. Is it equal and symmetrical? And then what's their work of breathing? So when you look at the work of breathing, there's probably some things on there you don't usually look at in adults, am I right? How many times do you see retractions in adults? Not a whole lot, really, but you see them a ton in kids. Again, that thin chest wall, so it's a little more uh, pliable in there. We get nasal flaring, tracheal tugging. They position themselves in a position of comfort. If a kid is comfortable breathing in a certain position, transport them in the position they are comfortable breathing in because they're putting themselves in a place to get the best air exchange. Um, that's especially true if you have someone like with croup or epiglottitis, even an asthmatic. Don't make them lay down. Um, head bobbing, that's opening the airway a lot. Grunting. Anybody know what kids are doing when they grunt? Yes, exactly. So kids that are grunting are trying to maintain that physiological peep and keep those alveoli open. Those kids are sick. I would tell you if that kid's breathing well, sitting up or in mom's laps, leave them there. That's the child when you lay them flat, they're going to stop breathing and they're going to arrest on you. So be careful with those kids. And yes, I'm speaking from experience. Breast sounds. Same things you're going to see in adults, right? Crackles is what? Fluid. Fluid. So pneumonia or pulmonary edema, wheezing, ronchi, diminished. Diminished can be poor ventilation if it's bilateral. It can indicate an infection or atelectasis. It can indicate a pneumothorax. But again, with a pneumo, you may or may not have a diminished side. With a tension pneumo, it's pretty significant usually. 
Um, and we talked about referred breast sounds. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say silent chest? Hmm? Uh, exactly. And the population you're going to hear that the most with in pediatrics is your asthma patient. I remember when I first started taking care of kids in the PICU, and I'm like, what do you mean this kid's wheezing? I don't hear anything. Well, it's because they weren't moving any air. And then I kept thinking, they're getting worse because I'm giving them more albuterol. Well, they were, well, back then it wasn't albuterol. But they were opening up. And the more they open, the more air exchange you hear. It may be louder, but that's better. So keep that in mind, that a silent chest does not mean good things usually. There's one, there's one situation, and you see this with adults as well, your bariatric patients. We have kids as young as four, five, six years old that are huge, way over what they should be for their weight. And sometimes it's really hard to hear breast sounds, especially in the era of COVID when you have to use those yellow, um, yeah, jack in the box, yeah, stethoscopes. And that's a lot of times when I will clean my own stethoscope and then clean it and put it on the cart and let it clean well, or whatever, dry after all the chemicals are on it because you can't hear sometimes with those patients and that's really hard. Um, cough, is it barky? Barky like a seal, that's probably croup. Is it dry bronchospastic like an asthma cough? Because remember with kids and even with some adults, they don't necessarily wheeze with asthma, they can cough. They can, their chest can be tight, their peak flow can be low and they will cough and you'll never hear a wheeze. You still treat them and they respond the same way. Um, or is it junky and loose? Do they have a pneumonia? What are you hearing with that? What color are their secretions? With the trach, what's an additional assessment piece you might want to know about the trach? What type? There's less types in kids than there is in adults. Yeah, that's always a good one. How long's it been there? So you know if you have a stable airway, if you have to change it out. How about size? And make sure you have that if you're picking up the kid and transporting them, you have another one of the same size and one of size smaller, always. Um, the other thing, look at the trach before you leave. Make sure the flangers are right against the skin and it's well secured before you transport. Okay, interventions, typical oxygen suction, medications that you've probably all seen before. You might need some CPAP or BiPAP or uh, heated high flow, bagging, ventilator. Remember with kids though, you have to be careful with the pressure you're using to ventilate them. So you should always never, if you have to bag somebody or put them on a vent, there always needs to be a pop-off valve. And if your alarms are going off for high pressure, you may have to evaluate, is my tube patent? What's going on? Did it come out? So really use your, um, your dope mnemonic for that when you're ventilating somebody. Needle decompression. If we have to needle decompress a child, where are we going to do it? Same place, second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. There is some evidence now in older patients, adults primarily, they're doing fifth, I think, intercostal space, mid, no, anterior axillary line. That's not necessarily approved for kids yet. It's not in any of the literature. So I would stick with second intercostal space. The issue is you've got to be very careful if you have a little peanut about the thymus, okay? Um, and if you needle decompress, know that a chest tube has to go in. You've just made a hole in the lung. Does everybody know what the mnemonic DOPE stands for? This will be true of a trach or an endotracheal tube. Dislodgement, Dislodgement obstruction. So you're going to suction and maybe have to put some saline down, see if you can get all the gunk out. Although you generally don't suction with saline, but if it's occluded, that might help unclog it versus have to replace it. P. Patient pneumo, yep. And E is your equipment. So, okay. What about circulation? Some really big differences in kids versus adults. Cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. Adults have the Starling curve, right? Put a little more fluid in, you get a nice stretch to their heart, and you improve your contractility. That does not happen in kids. The only way they can't uh, adjust their stroke volume until after about the age of eight or nine. 
Um, so the only way they have to improve their cardiac output or increase it is by increasing their heart rate. So you'll see them become tachycardic for so many things. Um, they also have very strong compensatory mechanisms. An adult, when they start to crash, they go kind of downhill trend, right? Kids, I'll never forget my first arrest. Do, 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 and the heart rate was gone. I, I'd never seen it happen like that before. Um, so just remember that they maintain that blood pressure a long time. When your pressure is low and they've dropped it, you're behind the eight ball because they're really quite sick if they've gotten to a low blood pressure. So what do you do for assessment? Pulses, central and peripheral. For a kid, a central pulse can be your brachial and your femoral pulses. We don't often do carotid. Um, look at your skin color, temperature, and moisture. We like pink, warm, and dry. Um, cap refill time. Not something you use in adults that much, is it? Huge, huge use in pediatrics. We do it all the time. Ideally, you want it to be about two seconds, one to two seconds. Um, the thing to remember is there's a lot of stuff that can impact your cap refill time. Your hands are cold. It's snowing out. They just came in from outside. They don't have any gloves on. They have a lack on their knee, and their cap refill time is four or five seconds. I'm not worried. It was cold outside. The other hand, if it's an extremity that's got a cast on, and it's not cold outside, and it's five seconds, I'm worried. Do I have compartment syndrome? Is this cast impinging on the circulation? So keep that in mind. Um, there's other things we can use with kids. When you're looking at their volume status, you can look at fontanelles. You don't have that advantage in adults. But what age does the fontanelle usually close at? Yeah, somewhere between about, some kids close as early as 12 months, but it, it usually is definitely close between 15 and 18 months. Um, skin turgor, eyes, if they're sunken, that you can use for adult or peds, but it's more defined, I think, in kids. Um, you know, the dry cracked lips, the dry mucous membranes. Um, the number one best indicator of how well you fluid resuscitated a patient is urine output. So if a kid's in diapers, when was the last time they wet their last diaper? You know, are they peeing normal? Um, did they have any blood loss? Make sure you're aware of that. And we already talked about blood pressure, how it falls late. A couple things to remember when you look at the blood pressure. Remember, your systemic vascular resistance how vasoconstricted or vasodilated you are is reflected by your diastolic pressure. If you have a kind of a low systolic and a really low diastolic, they're wide open. They're vasodilated. Let's say I have a patient hemorrhage from trauma. I'm going to see maybe a low diastolic and a pretty a low systolic and a really high diastolic because they're clamped down trying to compensate and maintain that blood pressure. So that can be really helpful if you remember that. Between that and the heart rate, it gives you a lot of information. So how are we going to treat these kids? We're going to do the same thing you do with adults. Lines, labs, fluids. How much of a bolus do we give for a child? Anybody know? 20 cc's per kilo. There are instances where we use 10 cc's per kilo. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Cardiac kid. And we do see kids with bad hearts, and we see kids with congenital um, anomalies which is where you want to know what the child's baseline is because they may live with a SAT of 75%, right? You don't want to correct it over that if that's where they live. Um, so cardiac kids, uh, what else? Yes, neonates. Under, we use two months, but generally speaking, a neonate is defined as less than 28 days, 28 days or less, and they only get 10 cc's per kilo, which comes in real handy when they come in at three kilos. I grab three 10 cc saline flushes, and that's my bolus. Um, and then uh, the other group is kids with renal failure. If they're on dialysis, you want to proceed cautiously. You might be giving five, you might be giving 10. Another group to think about is if you have a kid with known pulmonary issues, real bad pulmonary hypertension or bad lung disease, you may want to go cautiously and start small and add more. You can give it quickly. You just may have to give it multiple times small amounts. How fast can I give a bolus in a child? Yeah, you can give it as fast as you need to. 
where you have to be cautious, again, is the, somebody with heart failure or lung, fa lung issues. Just remember to reassess after each bolus. And what are you going to reassess? Not only your pulses, your cap refill, your skin color and temperature, your heart rate, your lungs. you got to listen. Make sure you're not putting them into pulmonary edema. Have you all heard of the push-pull method of giving fluids? Yeah? Okay. Um, the biggest other thing is with kids, make sure you're warming the fluid because they get cold really quickly. And as you know, that trauma triad of death with the hypothermia, acidosis, and the... Uh, yeah, acidosis. What did I say? Coagulopathy. Yeah, coagulopathy. That was it. I was like, wait a minute, I lost my train. Yeah, those things. That happens in kids, too. And it's not just in trauma. It can be medical. All right, so disability. This is where assessing a neural status on a 2-year-old is very different than on a 12-year-old, right? 12-year-old is more like an adult. You can ask them appropriate questions. You can't, aren't going to get those answers from a 2-year-old. They're scared of you, and they're not going to talk to you. Now, of course, then there's the one that walks up and sits on your lap every now and then. But look at, is the child developmentally appropriate for their age? And ask the parent, is this how they normally act? Or what's their baseline? Because you might have a 13-year-old that's neurologically devastated. So what is their normal baseline of function? So you can evaluate based on that. Um, and then even within the norms, there's a large variation. One two-year-old can be excel, and one may be a little behind. And that's OK. So what do you evaluate? The responsiveness, GCS. Has everybody heard of AVPU? Mm -hmm. OK, so you know that. So the big thing is, because you may not have the GCS that says, OK, for a one-year-old, this is how I do it. For a four-year-old, this is how I do it. There are three GCS scales. There's ones for infants a year and less. There's a one for one to age one to five. And then five and older is the adult scale. And the main thing that's different is the verbal response. Like, uh, there may, the infant one probably is a little bit different because they don't follow commands. But um, other than that, it's all verbal. It's cooing versus words versus a full sentence and oriented response. But the AVPU, you're going to look at what stimulus do they respond to and what's their response. So somebody may respond to pain, not verbal, but they might smack you and say, go away. Somebody else may do disturbed posturing. So just responding to pain is not all. You want to include that specifics a little bit more of what their response is. What are their pupils? Blood sugar is always something to think about in disability. Kids drop their blood sugar pretty quickly. They ha don't have great stores of glucose. And if they're stressed, they're using it a whole lot more. And so they can bottom out their blood sugar. So check that if they've got a decreased neural status or if they're seizing. Seizure activity. Doesn't look the same in all kids. Little neonates, they do bicycling with their legs and smack their lips. And sometimes it's even different than that. They, if they have a certain type of seizure called infantile spasms, they have these jerking movements. So you're not going to necessarily see a tronic, clonic jerking seizure in a child. It could be all sorts of stuff. If they're a known seizure disorder, ask the parent, what do they usually do? What else besides low blood sugar could cause a seizure? Anybody know electrolyte-wise? Low sodium. And we see it a lot in the summer or when parents are trying to stretch their formula because they don't have, they're on WIC, and the formula doesn't last quite the whole month, so they thin it out a little bit, and then the sodiums drop. And we see kids come in seizing their sodiums 120. It's really low. Um, exposure and environment, make sure you're undressing them. Get a full look. Know what lines, drains, injuries, whatever that they have before you transport and then keep them warm. So how are you going to do that? Warm blankets. Um, the thing that we all hate, but we all do, especially when we do burn kids, turn up the temperature in the room you're in, and we come out stinking and sweaty, but the child's warm, which is a good thing. Um, the other thing is you guys have in your transport those warming packs. You could break the little thing and put them under the baby. Those are fabulous. We use those a lot even in our department when we're doing a sepsis workup on a newborn because they're uncovered while well, we're getting lines and urine and all this kind of stuff. They work great. Yes, that's what I meant, the transformer. Yep, that's exactly what I was thinking of. Um, and hats. 
Little babies and newborns especially, they lose a lot of their heat through their head, so cover their head. Keep a hat on them. Um, warm fluids are a little harder to do during a transport, but good if you can do it. Vital signs. Again, know the patient's baseline. They vary with age. So for blood pressure, the normal low, low for two years and up is 70 plus two times the age in years. But that's low normal, okay? Usually most two-year-olds are going to be right around 80. Um, but things like heart rate can be way outside of the normal because they're afraid of you. Their heart rate's going to grow up. They're going to cry. Well, their heart rate's going to go up. And there may be nothing physiological wrong. That's their response. That makes it much harder to assess a child. They're screaming and crying. You're not going to get, you know they're moving good air. You don't know what their breath sounds are like. Um, outside temperature can impact your vital signs and underlying medical issue. And that's where I was talking about the heart defect. So if a child normally has a SAT of 75 to 80 percent because they've got a congenital heart defect, you put them on an armory breather because you're thinking, oh no, don't. You're going to make them worse. Um, you want to titrate it to what their norm is. Um, at the same token, if you have a kid that's a normal healthy kid and their SATs are 95 percent, yeah, you need to be worried and get it up to uh, above 95, just like you would any other patient. This is in PALS. I don't know if you guys take PALS, but they have a really good vital sign um, chart. It's always something you could consider making into a little thing to put on your badge so you'd have that reference. Um, and again, it's guidelines. As long as the kid's close and within that and it fits the situation you're in, you should be good. History. Well, why is the kid here and why are they getting whatever they're getting done that you're transporting them? That's important to know because it gives you an idea of what to expect and what you might have to intervene and do. Um, what kind of medical issues do they have? Um, allergies, especially food allergies because kids might get hungry. So you don't want to give them anything they're allergic to. Um, infectious disease in this day and age, I think we've all gotten pretty good at that with our isolation, much better than we ever used to be. What medications are they on? What did they just get? Okay, you're transporting an asthmatic. You need to know when their last NEB was, when their next one's due. Make sure you have a dose in case they decompensate while you're um, transporting them. Um, or pain medicine. They have a leg fracture. It's been three hours. You've got a one-hour transport to get that child here. Please, please, please give them pain medicine before you get on a bumpy road with them or take them through the hospital to get to x-ray for a study. They need that pain control. The other thing is important to know, oh, well, they, the nurse helped you out and gave pain medicine right before you got there. They're really sleepy. You need to know because, okay, it's okay that they're sleepy. They just got their pain medicine. So do you always do a full, complete head-to-toe assessment on every patient? Probably not. It depends on the situation. Some situations you may need to. But more often than not, it's going to be a focused assessment on where the issue is or the area of concern. Um, but again, it's depending on what you're doing. If you're coming from an outside facility here, you probably need to do a pretty good once over so you have a good idea of what's um, coming and what you're transporting. Um, the sicker the child is, the better it is to do a more in-depth assessment. So. We're going to go through a little bit about what's in each category for a head-to-toe assessment. Your neurological, you want to know your GCS. And again, ask the parent what's their baseline, what's their normal, and compare the patient to their baseline, not anybody else's. Pupils, movement of extremities, are they equal, strength equal? Do they have seizures or are they having seizures currently? Is their behavior different? Why am I concerned about behavior? hypoxic, but it can also be an indicator of an ingestion or some other metabolic process going on. There's a lot of things that can alter your behavior. And if everything else looks okay and the mom's like, he's just not acting right, maybe it's a brain tumor that hasn't been diagnosed yet. You don't know. Maybe it's an ingestion. Maybe he's had a psychotic break. So uh, always ask if behavior's altered, you want to know why. And is there any drainage from the nose or the ears? Clear drainage, I'm worried about what? CSF leak, right? 
And sometimes, although we've had no RSV this year, I think we've had two cases all year, that clear drainage is RSV if it's a normal, healthy, happy, smiling Weezer that's all goopy. It's clear usually. Neck, is there any swelling? And that's important to know, internal or external, because you're transporting a kid, you need to be concerned about their airway, right? So internal, what could cause some of that swelling? Pardon? Yeah. Uh-huh. Anaphylaxis. Burns. Infectious disease. So peritonsillar abscess and retropharyngeal abscess are two of the most common ones we see. Used to be epiglottitis. We don't tend to see that much anymore. Um, could be croup. External swelling. We get a lot of kids with lumps, you know, mastoiditis. Is it compressing? Is there a new tumor? Injuries, tracheal deviation. Muffled voice is a sound that there's something going on inside that it's swollen. Um, and that's usually kids with retropharyngeal abscesses or even a peritonsillar abscess often come in with that kind of sound to their voice. Um, and then look at their throat. What color is it? Are their tonsils touching? Um, are there lesions, white patches, whatever? Everybody here old enough, like I am, to remember look, listen, and feel with CPR. I love that because to me, that's how I tend to assess. Look, listen, and feel. So I love that when it comes with the chest. Looking at the chest, I'm going to see any obvious injuries. How are they breathing? What's their work of breathing? Then I'm going to listen. It will also, when I'm looking, are there any bruises or deformities? Um, breath sounds, heart sounds. We already talked about referred sounds in silent chest. What's their work of breathing? Respiratory rate and heart rate. Do they have equal chest rise and fall? Cough. We talked about what the cough would be like. The other thing that's important, how much support are they needed using right now to maintain their respiratory status? If you have a child you're transporting on an armory breather with a SAT of 100%, you can probably wean them down pretty a little bit, right? But if you have a child that you have on an armory breather and their SATs are only 92%, you're getting a little concerned and wondering if you need to take over and ventilate that patient and take care of their airway. Um, medications, what are they getting, uh, and then any obvious injuries, be it bruising, deformities, that sort of thing. Probably one of the number one things we see in the hospital is asthma and respiratory things in pediatrics. If you look at, it's probably a good percentage of patients, that and fever. Abdomen, same thing. Look, listen, and feel. Are there any bruises? Is it distended? Um, are you seeing any waves of peristalsis across there? Uh, then you're going to listen. Why do you listen first before you palpate? Yeah, it can change your exam. When you palpate, it might stir things. You might see hear a little bit of movement, and it's not true bowel activity. Always start with a kid. You should do this for anybody. But always start with the area with no pain, and then move to the painful area, if you patients awake and can tell you that. With kids, a couple of the things you might feel with masses, sometimes if it's a little tiny baby, they may have pyloric stenosis, and you can feel that walnut right where the pylorus is. I'm on the wrong side. Um, tenderness, where is the pain, where's the location of the pain, and even the description of the pain, where it is. That's all the same as an adult. So there's a lot of things as we go through this that aren't a whole lot different, but there's some things that kids have a little bit of uh, fine-tuning. Vomiting, description. Is it a little bit of spit up? They're vomiting, throwing up everything. Well, how much? Can you show me? Oh, it's about this much, and it's white, and it's after they're feeding. Well, maybe they're overfeeding. They're throwing up everything. It's got a foul smell to it. It's dark in color. Maybe it's bilious. It's real watery. Big difference in how sick that child could be. And then diarrhea. Diarrhea is the number, probably the number one cause of dehydration in pediatric patients, not the vomiting. They can lose so much water and volume through diarrhea. So getting a good description of that if it's in fact happening. And then knowing what devices does your child have. Um, if you're transporting, are they fed via an NG tube? Do they have a gastrostomy? Do they have a GJ? They've got multiple tubes, which one's which? 
Keeping that straight is sometimes difficult, and your best resource is the parent because they're doing all that at home. They'll know. Um, the other thing is injury and scars. Are there any scars on the belly telling you what's been going on? Perineal area. Most patients, you're not going to have to look at this too much, but there may be a situation where this is warranted depending on why you're transporting or what's going on. Um, are there any bruising or bleeding? And bleeding can be a couple of different things because is it vaginal bleeding or blooded amiatus or is there bleeding someplace else from a tear or a laceration? What's going on? Um, kids tend to jump on things and not realize like bars of bikes and jumping from bed to bed and hitting straddle, having straddle injuries on the bed rail that goes like this. and. <laughs> Those just make me hurt when I see those. They could have a rash. It could be a normal diaper rash, or is it something way out of the extraordinary that you need to be concerned about? Um, do they have signs of infection, meaning is it foul smelling? Do they have any drainage? Um, pelvic instability. What's the risk with an unstable pelvis? Blood loss, right. And they can be pretty hemodynamically unstable. So make sure you're stabilizing that pelvis before you do any movement. Um, you are taking a patient on a two-hour transport. <laughs> you went to get them from somewhere, and it's going to take you two hours to get there. And you've got a three-year-old, four, let's say four-year-old. What are you going to do when you're an hour into it and they have to pee? So always know how they're voiding before you leave. Make sure you have a bedpan if they're potty trained, or that you have a change of diapers if they have diapers, or do they have a Foley. So keep that in your mind if you're transporting a young child. Um, do you have to pee before we leave? Kind of like walking out the door with your kids before you're going on a long drive, if you, for those of you that have kids. Um, extremities. Typical assessment is no different in a child than an adult. Your neurovascular status, uh, movement, pulses, skin color, and temperature, and are there any signs of injury? So let's talk about a couple of cases. So we'll go through these kind of quickly and see what you think. So Christy is a four-year-old post-MVC. Her airway's patent. She's already been intubated and she's being ventilated by a ventilator. Under circulation, you see her assessment. She's got a GCS of three because we did RSI with sedation. So what do you think with this assessment? What do we need to do and what should we give her? So warm blood, fluids, Yep, absolutely. So she's pale. Notice the blood. Pardon? Yes, absolutely. Pelvic binder. Because you bind that up, you decrease the ongoing losses, right? Perfect. What did you say? Oh, okay. <laughs> you got it. Um, notice the blood pressure. Look at how close the diastolic and the systolic are. This kid's working hard, and that high heart rate, this child's really compensating and working really hard to try and keep themselves perfused. Um, but yeah, warmed blood is ideal, but you may have to give them a bolus of fluid to start with. So again, we're giving 20 cc's per kilo because this is a four-year-old, correct? Mm -hmm. OK. So those are our vital signs afterwards. What do you think? 82 over 50 and a heart rate of 150? Yeah, looks a little better, doesn't it? Probably still need to get some blood in. Cap refills three seconds, a little warmer. But remember, we've got that pelvic fracture, so they may have on, we may not see the bleeding. It may be internal. And a child, if you have a kid that's 15 kilos, remember their blood volume is only about a liter and a half. Unlike you and I that have four or five liters, in our, five or six liters in our body, they don't have that much volume. So if they lose 500 cc's into their pelvis, they've lost a third of their blood volume. So 10 minutes later, this happens. Blood pressure is now 76 over 60. Heart rate spikes and then drops. So they're now bradycardic. They're cold, mottled. Your ventilator is alarming, high pressure. And you have no breath sounds on your right side. What's going on? Pneumo. Tension pneumo, OK? Um, and what are we going to do? Perfect. Needle decompressed and then chest tube. I saw a child. He was six or seven. Came in, cutest little boy, talking 90 miles an hour. 
He had been ran over by a car, and you could see the tire tracks across his chest. He was talking and awake, and we had him on all the monitors. We'd already gotten a chest x-ray done, and he kind of went unconscious. And his heart rate went, meow. And they had just put up the chest x-ray and said, he's got a tension nubo. We needled his chest. He said, ouch, and woke back up and started talking again. Until we gave him ketamine to put him out to put his chest again. But I'll never, that was probably 25 years ago, and I will never forget that child or his face. All right, here's our second patient. Got an 11 year old female with fever and neutropenia that you're taking from the oncology floor to MRI. Um, what do you need to know about her? Yep, vitals. Pardon? Yep. Allergies. And also, when was her last dose of antibiotics? Because are they sending you off the, she just, she's fever and neutropenic. She got one dose of antibiotics and it's not even a half an hour afterwards and they're sending you off the floor. You don't want to do that because that's when they crash. Um, notoriously, oncology patients, when we give initial dose of antibiotics in the ED, we monitor them for 30 to 60 minutes afterwards because that's the time period the, the antibiotics are hitting that bacteria, you get that endotoxin release, and guess what? That's when their blood pressure crashes. So we try not to transport or do much at that time point. You want to make sure you're past that. Um, so those are her current vital signs. So what do you think? Not bad. You comfortable transporting with those vitals? Yeah. Yep, she would probably be okay. You get into MRI and this happens. So I really don't feel good. What's going on? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, she's, yeah, she's spiking a temp, so she's septic, right? Yeah, she's compensating so far, but look at the diastolic pressure. That's a big indicator that she's vasodilated. And remember, you start with warm shock before you go into cold shock with sepsis. If you, if you see that whole progression, not everybody goes through that whole progression. Tachycardic, low diastolic, SATs aren't great, hot to touch. So she needs some fluids. We probably need to let the team know that she's not doing so good. Then this happens. We give her a bolus. Here's our repeat vital signs. What are you going to do? Hopefully, if you're in our MRI scanner, you're calling an RRT because you don't want to be down there with this child like this, right? Blood pressure is now deteriorated more. Heart rate's up 140. Respiratory rate, SATs. This child needs to probably get another bolus and probably go on a norepi drip. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Okay, well, hopefully I gave you a little bit, was able to share a little bit of my knowledge with you to help you get through when you have a child and this afternoon and stuff. Um, but I'm in uh, Out Outlook, so if you have a question, feel free to shoot me an email. Okay. No problem. Oh, I can just leave that there, can't I? You want? Oh, wait a minute. I don't need to take this with me. I want that. Thank you. Do I even need to bring? No, you're good.